Abu Bakr Bashir was one of the two co-founders of Jamaat Islamia J.I. His role was essentially to promote the extremist ideology and to create a climate within which such attacks could occur. Ini adalah media pertama sejak kepulangan Ustad dari Gunung Sindur yang mendapatkan kesempatan untuk mewawancarai Ustad Abu Bakar Basir. Tidak ke saya, langsung ke kamera. Ya, jadi Ustad Abu Bakar Basir itu amat cinta dengan kasih sayang dengan ini. Beliau bukan tipikal orang suka kekerasan. Boleh Ustad apa ini? This was one of the biggest blast site crime scenes in recent history. My name is Tim Morris. I was the operational commander of the Australian Federal Police in the Bali bombing. I'm Ben McDevitt. And at the time of the Bali bombings, I was the Assistant Commissioner in charge of counter-terrorism for the Australian Federal Police. So the two blasts, one was a smaller explosion at Paddy's Bar. And the second was a large vehicle borne explosion outside the Sari Club. There was not only the damage to the buildings in the immediate vicinity, but there was damage for hundreds of metres away from the Sari Club. Well, it can be frustrating when no clue immediately points you to a particular suspect. We were mostly reluctant to say specifically that it was the work of suicide bombers because we weren't sure. This was a sensitive subject for everyone. There have been reports of suicide bombers in the Middle East and uh, Afghanistan, but never before in Southeast Asia had a suicide bombing like this ever been recorded. So there's no guarantee that you will identify the perpetrators and bring them to justice. As it turned out, the vehicle used in the main explosion outside the Sari Club was a Mitsubishi van. We needed to identify exactly where that van came from. That led to examination of components of the vehicle. The chassis was, as you can imagine, after a bomb of that size, a, a mangled wreck of twisted steel. Once that chassis number was identified, we turned the corner. Ultimately, once that unique vehicle identification number had been found on the chassis of the Mitsubishi van, then came the process of trying to trace the owner of the van from that chassis number off the vehicle, the detectives in Indonesia traced that vehicle back through six unregistered owners. In other words, somebody had bought the car, sold it to somebody else, then somebody else had bought the car, sold it to somebody else, and none of that information was recorded. The Indonesian National Police were really expert at tracking people down. They excelled at getting a piece of information and using their networks to very quickly identify where individuals were. Well, the person who sold the van to Amrosi actually remembered him. He has that huge smile, it's permanently on his face, it's very unique. But most importantly, he was there flashing a lot of money around. US dollars, Thai baht, Malaysian ringgit. It wasn't your normal type of used car transaction. They knocked on his door and I was told that he said, my gosh, you are clever fellows. 
My name is Benny Mamoto. I was the key investigator in Bali bombing. Sayalah yang pertama kali mengungkap dan berhasil membuka mulutnya Amrozi yang kemudian mengaku bahwa dia terlibat dalam bom Bali 1 meskipun tidak selaku eksekutor dia yang mengatur pendanaan yang dia terima pembelian bahan baku dan sebagainya. M. Rosie acted as the quartermaster, if you like, for the Bali bombers. He had uh, played a role in purchasing the explosives. He had also purchased the van. The search of M. Rosie's house yielded, you know, a treasure trove of materials and evidence including copies of speeches that linked Amrozi to Jamar Islamia and its spiritual leader Bashir. Once Amrozi was arrested, we also had access to his mobile phone. So that yielded us a huge amount of data at tracking people down. Only a matter of weeks really following the bombings, four of the key players had been identified within a relatively short period after the bombings. Amrozi himself and then Samudra, who was one of the other masterminds involved, and then Amrozi, two brothers, Muklas and Ali Imran. Ali Imran's arrest proved critical. He confirmed suicide bombers had been utilised and Jamar Islamia was behind the Bali bombings. I am Inspector General Martinez Hukum. I was involved in investigating bomb Bali. Balis, disitulah mata publik terbuka bahwa ada satu organisasi Jamaah al Islamia. Nah, setelah penyelidikan mendalam, disitulah kita tahu bahwa organi apa kejadian bom di Bali ini dibiayai langsung oleh Al Qaeda. A relatively modest amount of approximately US $30,000 equivalent was supplied to Jamaah Islamia in Indonesia. And the cell led by Samudra used those funds to buy the chemicals, the van, to rent the safe house in Bali. Of all the people involved in the bombing, of course, some were executed. Ali Imran was spared execution because of the cooperation that he extended to the Indonesian police. Ali Imran actually assembled the bombs. More than that, he drove the two suicide bombers to the site of the Sari Club and Paris Bar. Kalau Bali jadi sasaran, Ya karena intinya bahwa penyerangan di Bali itu hanya untuk menyerang orang-orang bule. Karena orang-orang bule ini dimungkinkan adalah orang-orang Amerika dan sekutunya. Karena mau membalas Amerika, tentara Amerika suka menyerang Afghanistan. The bombings were designed to be conducted initially at the one year anniversary of September 11th. Apparently the bombers weren't actually ready at that one year anniversary, so ultimately the bombings were put back until October 12th. Di bom mobil itu ada beberapa yang harus disiapkan. Yang jelas pertama adalah mobilnya. <laughs> Di 
yang kami cari sejak pertama adalah mobil. Dari Lamongan setelah dapat mobil, kami bawa ke Denpasar, Bali. Tanggal 4 Oktober, saya bawa ke rumah kontrakan kami di Jalan Pulau Menjangan. Dan saat itu masuk, tidak keluar lagi, kemudian keluar setelah sudah ada bomnya, yaitu di malam tanggal 12 Oktober itu. The main ingredient in the Sari Club bomb was potassium chlorate. Potassium chlorate, which is found in things like bleachers and in matchsticks and so on. But when combined with sulfur and other chemicals, it can actually have an enormous explosive capability. The potassium chlorate itself was sourced to a chemical supply shop in Surabaya, which was about 10 hours travel away from the site where it was ultimately used. We saw Jamar Islamiyah deploy a new type of technology, and what they purchased was like a plastic filing cabinet type of construct that you can often buy in supermarkets with a row of plastic drawers. They had purchased 12 of them in which they encased the explosives. With the row of plastic drawers, usually four or five high, and they loaded the potassium chlorate into each of the drawers of these boxes. The bombers had removed the rear seats from the old van and then placed those crates containing the explosives into the rear of the van. Ali Imran was essential in actually delivering the bomb. He drove the white van just near the Sari Club, actually. Ali Imran then alighted. He'd escaped the scene. and the suicide bomber drove the last few metres right out the front of the Sari Club. When it was hit, there was no surprise. It was a feeling of pain, because it was not Takut ketahuan, tapi tegang karena ini jelas bahwa bom ini besar, pasti korbannya banyak. Mungkin yang memahami 100% bahwa perencanaan pengeboman di Bali untuk menyerang orang-orang bule ini jihad yang benar secara 100%, mungkin senangnya juga 100%. Tapi bagi seperti saya, itu kan tidak setuju 100% dan tidak memahami bahwa itu adalah jihad yang benar itu tidak 100%. Oleh karena itu, kalau saya rasakan pada waktu itu tidak ada keber, kegembiraan yang berlebihan. there when the, the bomb exploded in Surrey Club, 2002. Never really left Bali, I always come back here, even now. I always had a connection with this island, and with this bomb, it just made it stronger. Yeah, so we just passed by the American consulate here in Bali, right behind me over there. They placed one of the bombs. There were three bombs that night. This was the smallest one, and fortunately, nobody got hurt. I 
Awalnya itu konsulat Amerika ini akan dibom bunuh diri dengan sepeda motor. Karena pelakunya mundur karena belum siap, tidak mahir atau tidak lancar dalam menyetir motor. Akhirnya kami ganti dengan bom tas jinjing. Mengapa dikasih ditambahkan kotoran set, di, bom, apa, di bom konsulat Amerika? Karena sasaran kita bukan masyarakat umum. Maka saya kasih kotoran sehingga ketika orang lewat di situ ada bau kotoran itu sehingga tidak akan mengambil mengambilnya itu tujuan saya pribadi. Kenapa harus konsulat Amerika? Kami memberi pesan dan kesan bahwa penyerangan di Bali ini penyerangan buat Ame Amerika. I'm Zora Sukabdi. I spent years studying about the mind of terrorists. The bonds between GI and Al Qaeda members are very strong. Lasted many years. Many of GI members flew to Afghanistan. They fight together with Mujahideen against the Soviet. Called Mujahideen or the freedom fighters were against the occupying Soviet army in Afghanistan in the 1980s. It was made up not just of Afghan resistance fighters, but also Arabs that joined them to fight against the Soviets. And amongst the Arab fighters were a contingent from uh, the Middle East, including Osama bin Laden. As the conflict ended, a group of these fighters, led by Osama bin Laden, formed Al-Qaeda and turned it into an organization committed to global jihad. So, Jemaah Islamiyah's links with Al-Qaeda are historical. Going back to the 1980s... Of six Bali bombers, four of them was an alumni of Mujahideen in Afghanistan, including Ali Imran. Ada lebih dari 200 bahkan 250 orang yang merupakan lulusan Afghanistan di era tahun 80-an sampai 90-an. Mereka mendapatkan pelatihan militer yang sangat apa namanya efektif di mana mereka punya kemampuan untuk menyerang, membuat bom, apa kemampuan-kemampuan field engineering. My name is Febi Isran. And this is what Jamaah Islamiyah do to me. I heard some blast, some hotspot came to me, and then I'm trying to recover my body with the uh, like this, and then I uh, went up like uh, one meter, and then I fell out. I have 42 percent burning of my skin. My hand, as you see, the back, my knee, and some in my feet. Walk is uh, very hard. There was a bomb, a suicide bomber with the car. The bomb uh, was in front of JW Marriott Hotel in Jakarta. I was inside. And the flame is like uh, when the people blow it from the mouth, it's the huge. So it's like uh, licking your whole body. Twelve people died and then 150 is injured. So actually, after the Bali bombing, we have experienced many attacks committed by GI. This is a ten lakh -like for them to push their goal because they want to have Indonesia as an Islamic-based Sharia country.
So they create a chaotic situations through many attacks after the Bali bombings. But such thinking and planning had been going on even before the Bali attacks. Bombs went off in cities across the country on Christmas Eve. And besides the 20 people who died, at least 95 others were also injured in the bombings. So the Bali bombings of uh, October 2002 were not the first time J.I. had struck in Indonesia. A particularly significant attack J.I. had engaged in was actually in uh, Christmas 2000. On that date, Imam Samudra, who was involved in the Bali bombings, he had a plot to set up bombs which to be placed in churches. J.I., they had constructed a series of small bombs in cardboard boxes, a method apparently used in Afghanistan with quite some success. And the plan was to kill as many Christians as possible in Indonesia to try and invoke a civil war uh, between Muslims and Christians across Indonesia. This has always been the GI playbook. Create and foster enmity between Christians and Muslims, ensuing violence and chaos. So the Christmas Eve bombings, the attack was deemed largely as unsuccessful by the Jamaa Islamiyah hierarchy. This Christian Muslim enmity did not materialize because the Christians at that time, they understood that this was not the work of the entire Muslim community, but it was just a, a few individual extremists. And also a lot of the bombs didn't explode. The bombs did not explode in part because of the cardboard boxes. My name is Jolene Gerard. I am a counter-terrorism analyst. The JI bomb makers had placed them in cardboard boxes. Was that's what they were trained to do? In Afghanistan, which was much drier, cardboard boxes did not affect the integrity of both the electronics as well as the explosives. On the flip side, in Indonesia, because of the humidity and the climate, this had impacted the electronics of the explosives. The bombs that predominantly exploded were those that were put into plastic casings and plastic containers. As a result of this experience, one lesson learned was that, you know, in the tropical climate, you shouldn't use cardboard, you should use uh, plastic to house your bombs. So the lessons they learned at the Christmas Eve bombings would certainly come in handy for later operations. Because the Christmas Eve uh, 2000 attacks were not that successful in J.I.'s view, in certainly Hambali's view, Hambali was determined to be more successful the next time round. And this is where he began to turn his sights towards what many extremists see as the most iconic target in Southeast Asia, which is Singapore. The mastermind behind the Christmas Eve bombings was Hambali, dubbed by the US intelligence services as the Osama bin Laden of Southeast Asia. Hambali served as the point person linking J.I. with Al-Qaeda. While he was in Afghanistan, he met Osama bin Laden and the relationship cemented itself and resulted in Hambali becoming the Al-Qaeda point person within our region. 
Because the Christmas Eve uh, 2000 attacks were not that successful, in JI's view, in certainly Hambali's view, Hambali was determined to be more successful the next time round. And this is where he began to turn his sights towards what many extremists see as the most iconic target in Southeast Asia, which is Singapore. Hambali had two goals. The first goal was to increase tension between Singapore and Malaysia and hopefully uh, spark a holy war. Hambali's second goal was to target Singapore because of its policies that were seen and deemed to be very close to the West. The GI ideology by this time was also very much influenced by the Al-Qaeda global jihad ideology. So the West was very much in GI sites as well. So goal number two would be achieved through the attacks of the US Embassy, the Australian High Commission, as well as the Israeli Embassy in Singapore. J.I. saw Singapore as having policies that were aligned to the West and its allies. Hambali's goal to increase tensions between Singapore and Malaysia would be achieved by targeting the water supply lines between Singapore and Malaysia. These pictures were taken from J.I. members in Singapore. Photographs of multiple reservoirs that they intended to target The other ways that J.I. was aiming to cripple infrastructure in Singapore included targeting Changi Airport. Train stations, the MRT. Also, interestingly, the Ministry of Education. J.I. being influenced by Al-Qaeda was actually against secular education systems. Hambali would be orchestrating through the bomb makers a bringing together of an envisioned 17 tonnes of ammonium nitrate. To put it in context, during the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, used two tonnes of ammonium nitrate, which saw 168 people dead. Pada waktu itu, sebetulnya saya pribadi dan alumni Afghanistan ini itu merencanakan pengeboman di Singapura yang berangkat ke Filipin dan belanja bahan peledak atau hack eksplosif kemudian dimasukkan dibawa ke Manado dari Manado baru kami bawa ke Batam baru kami rencanakan pengeboman di Singapura. The Internal Security Department has arrested 15 people for terrorism-related activities, including plans to bomb targets in Singapore. 13 are members of a clandestine organization which calls itself Jama'a Islamia. The Home Affairs Ministry says the arrests were made between December 9th and 24th last year. The Singapore plot, in a way, was thwarted through a combination of hard work on the part of the local intelligence agencies, as well as, uh, well, I would say, Divine intervention or pure luck. It was someone from the community that had given a tip off to the authorities. The citizen overheard an individual commenting that he had known Osama bin Laden. That led to the tip off and the eventual arrest of 13 individuals. So the Singapore plot was thwarted completely. This merely made Hambali more determined to succeed. Security has been heightened in Singapore as global tension mounts. The Singapore Armed Forces have deployed armed, uniformed soldiers to secure vital installations like Changi Airport. Hambali then changed up his strategy because no longer was key installations and hard targets an area that he could focus on given the increased security parameters. Kalau saya sendiri adalah kecewa dengan tidak jadinya pengeboman di Singapura. 
ketika kemudian hari hal itu nggak jadi malah perencanaan pengeboman di Bali. In a meeting that Hambali had convened in Thailand in 2002 in January, Hambali announced they should then switch towards soft targets. These included nightclubs. Amongst those at the meeting in Thailand was Muklas. Muklas went back to Indonesia and started the groundwork. And that was the genesis of the Bali attacks. Hello, Leo. I assume uh, Leo is okay there. All right. I was head of ASIO, Australia's counter-terrorism and counter-espionage organization at the time of the Bali bombing. What was Abu Bakar Bashir's role in the Bali bombing? It's questionable whether Abu Bakar Bashir actually engaged in any specific planning. Bashir provided a literal extreme interpretation of the Quran. He provided a framework within which Western societies and peoples were seen as being anti-Islamic. And very often, terrorists do need that to make them comfortable with the suffering they're inflicting on others. Abu Bakr Bashir, co-founders of Jamaat Islamia JI. His role was essentially to create a climate within which such attacks could occur. Bashir was never actually convicted for a direct role in the Bali bombings. He was convicted for his role in funding terrorist training camp in Aceh several years later. Dismay and distress from survivors of the 2002 Bali bombings after Indonesia freed Abu Bakar Bashir. After serving about 10 years of his 15 years jail sentence, the 82-year-old cleric is now being released. After his release from prison, Bashir went straight home to the Al Mukmin Islamic boarding school in Solo, Central Java. He's not very active now, but his main role would essentially be as a rallying symbol for the Islamist extremists in Indonesia. Ini adalah media pertama sejak bulan Januari kepulangan Ustad dari Gunung Sindur mendapatkan kesempatan untuk mewawancarai Ustad Abu Bakar Basir. Pengetahuan kami itu bahwa Ustadz Abu sebetulnya sejak sejak jamaah Islamiyah bermasalah, beliau tidak lagi terlibat. E, terus terang saja, pada awal kasus bom Bali itu beliau juga tercengang-kengang ya, artinya ya jadi Ustadz itu amat cinta dengan kasih sayang dengan ini. Beliau bukan tipikal orang suka kekerasan. Boleh Ustadz Abain? Islam itu juga menganjurkan, mengizinkan, meskipun orang non-muslim harus perlu bantuan urusan dunianya harus dibantu. Jadi, misalnya orang non-muslim sakit, kekurangan dana, nah, apalagi kalau tetangga, harus dibantu. Harus. Islam tidak boleh memaksa orang non-muslim masuk, masuk Islam. Islam. Harus, nah, apa namanya, dikakwai dengan dengan beberapa alasan-alasan yang kuat. Kalaupun tidak mau, ya sudah. Tidak apa-apa, karena itu memang haknya. Kalau yang mahal kuasa begitu, tidak boleh dipaksa. There will always be anger. 
with Bashir, there'll always be anger because to my mind, he hasn't been punished enough. Over 200 people killed. He probably should never have been released from jail. I'm a part of Densus 88. We are a special unit from Indonesia and I'm not allowed to tell my name and my identity. Transition! Anis, scanning to What makes us Dentus 88 special? Because we had skills in the jungle in the urban area that other police didn't have. Selama 22, 20 tahun terakhir ini, Densus 88 sangat sukses dalam melakukan penanganan teroris di Indonesia. Indonesia is responding the Bali bombing by creating Densus 88. The Indonesian government collaborate with Australian government because many casualties not only from Indonesia but also from Australia. So Australia give training to Densus 88. Then, so after the training for many years, slowly they are becoming strong. Then, so 88, they are apprehended so many GI members. So even though there are many attacks, the strength of the bombing is not as strong as the Bali bombing in 2002, and the casualties is also less. Yes, J.I.'s capabilities were slowly being chipped away in the aftermath of the 2002 Bali attacks. But that was not to say that J.I. was completely down and out. What helped J.I. was uh, certainly by mid-2014, the world's attention was uh, drawn towards this new global threat emerging in Syria and Iraq, which was the Islamic State. ISIS stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. They are actually established in Syria. ISIS is an offshoot of Al-Qaeda. So ISIS came from Al-Qaeda. So in many ways, the ISIS is ideologically similar to Al-Qaeda. But ISIS tends to be a bit more impatient. They believe that you can create a caliphate now. M. Polis Brigadir Jenderal Ahmad Nur Wahid with Indonesia Counter Terrorism Agency. Uh, terjadi berbagai aksi tindakan teror yang dilakukan oleh afiliasi ISIS yang ada di Indonesia. Seperti terjadi bom tamrin di 2016 dan berbagai aksi terorisme di tempat lainnya. <tuh> So the Indonesian authorities tended to focus on the pro-ISIS groups and this gave JI a bit of a breathing space. Indonesian security forces still would view JI as a major threat. Jemaah Islamia remains a threat because their grand strategy is still to establish an Islamic caliphate. Now, experts also believe Jemaah Islamia's membership is back to around 2000 where it was before its most notorious attack in Bali in 2002. Untuk jamaah Islamia sebenarnya sudah berbagai beberapa kali dilakukan penangkapan. Nah dari keterangan pimpinan jamaah Islamia berkembang ke berbagai atau ke banyak orang yang merupakan pengurus ataupun uh, anggota jamaah Islamia. Semenjak 2018 sampai sekarang dalam konteks ini Densus 88 anti teror di bawah koordinasi. BNPT berhasil menggagalkan lebih dari 1400 upaya aksi teror dengan menangkap uh, tersangkanya. I'm Rakyat Adi Brata. I'm a terrorism analyst in Indonesia for 20 years. The ISIS affiliates groups in Indonesia looks like a bunch 
of Boy Scouts comparing with the with the GI uh, in Indonesia. Terror attacks. If it's being done by ISIS affiliates, the bombing will be here and there. But it's never going to be as devastating as when the GI planned the terror attacks. From about 2009, rather than draw attention to themselves by engaging in high-profile attacks, they would just focus on slow rebuilding of their strength, building up their financial capabilities. Indonesia is the biggest uh, palm oil producers in the world, around like 16 to 17 million hectares of land is being used as a palm oil plantations. Jama Islamia use palm oil plantations to raise money. The palm oil plantation that's located in Sumatra, for example, is located in a remote isolated locations. Very suitable for a terrorist organization running a business like this. And another thing, as a legitimate business, you can buy fertilizer, but also potassium chlorate as a, a weed killer. Potassium chlorate was used in Bali bombings. One of our cleric in the National Ulama of Indonesia was arrested recently because he collected donation and distributed to GI, Jama Islamia. MUI or Ulama Indonesia is supposed to be very clean from any extremism activity. In recent years, there's a couple of uh, reports of GI uh, infiltrating organizations within the community, within the society. And those things, it's quite uncommon in the past. Nama saya, Sudarnoto Abdul Hakim. Ahmad Anaja, salah satu anggota dari Majlis Fatwa. Anggota MU itu ratusan, itu uh, tidak setiap orang yang berada di bawah naungan atau anggota MU itu terdeteksi pikiran-pikirannya. JI in its preparatory phase, a phase called Idado, it is a strategy of regrouping and rebuilding in order to make a comeback. Jama Islamia, if they want to have Indonesia as Islamic uh, Sharia-based country, and as long as this dream is not yet fulfilled, I think they will not stop. This is the main memorial point for all the uh, Australian victims of the 2002 bombing in Bali. This memorial is to the, all the victims of the local area around here in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, um, including the six dolphin boys that died, being Shane, Adam, Josh, Dave, Clint and Jared. This is now the, the emblem, the badge of the Kuji Dolphins and represent the guys that died in the Bali bombing. Number six, which was Clint Thompson. Then we had number 10 being Adam Howard. Number five, Dave Mavrudis. Number eight, Shane Foley. And number three was Josh Iliff. And number four was Jared Yo. I think what Bali did was to drive home in a brutal, tragic, way, just how terrible terrorism could be. I literally had to tell all the families that and their sons were dead. We managed to find five out of the six guys that were missing. The only one we couldn't find was Jared Yeo and he was only eventually identified through DNA. Uh, his body was too badly burnt to be able to be recognised. Uh, 
After 20 years, I think that jazz is not done already. Abu Bakar Bazir now is free. Sampai hari ini Hambali masih ada di Guantanamo. Jadi saya sangat berharap dari pemerintahan Amerika memberikan final punish untuk Hambali. Di tengah badai dunia mengakutkan hatiku tetap tenang teduh. 20 years already Bali bomb happened. I'm worried because they can do like a uh, same again with a different team. Tiap langkahku Ku tahu Tuhan yang pimpin. For me, Jemaah Islamia have the full set of the capabilities and the skill set to do terror attacks. It's just only a time they will do a terror attack in the future. Twenty years on, it's frustrating, but it's. Uh... It's a fact of life that we now live in a world where we've just got to be constantly prepared for another Bali type incident because there are still those out there who despise liberal democracies and the sort of lifestyles that we live.